OWC Eats, the web series where we find out more about where our food comes from. Hey, welcome to the show. Today we're out at the Timber Ridge Ranch. <laughs> we're here with Glenn and Kelly Hall at the north end of the Porcupine Hills. Uh, tell us a little bit about your ranch. We have about 200 pairs of cows up here and we make beef out of sunshine and grass. 200 pairs of cows? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about some of the partners that you work with or that the relationships you've developed. Many years ago we decided that um, we needed to gather allies. We had the rare occasion of finding a piece of land up at Timber Ridge which doesn't come available very often. We're kind of in a space where the small ranchers and the big ranchers start, we're right on a border. So we decided to find some allies and those allies included uh, the Alberta Conservation Association, um, became our partners actually. We've done um, uh, lots of workshops and lots and lots of learning with the Old Man Watershed Council, Cows and Fish, Ducks Unlimited, Salts, Southern Alberta Land Trust Society, Foothills Forage, we were very encouraged because we learned that we had a lot to learn um, and there was a lot of experts out there that had some knowledge and some experience that they would share with us. So we've learned about stewardship a lot over the last 30 years. How important have those relationships been in terms of running your operation here? We always learn and we're always getting new ideas. From Never too old to, to learn new things. We got to Sometimes we have to change our paradigms, do things different than say grandpa used to do them and try and, and uh, look after the land as best we can and, and carry on that way. Because we manage a living system, it's always changing. So whether it be cows themselves or the ecosystem that we are responsible for, things are always changing and it's dynamic always. So it's so important for us to have those critical ears and that critical advice that people are willing to share or experience. A perfect example would be um, some of the watershed equipment that we use. We've had some great conversations with neighbors, experts, about how do you build a good stream crossing? Something as simple as um, rubber versus wood. Rubber is quiet. Wood is slippery. So bottom line is having those conversations with people is really important. We've, we've actually um, experimented with both and found out that there's ways to make, um, make both rubber and wood work. The most important thing is to recognize the habitual nature of a cow and find out that there's a place where she likes to cross and she actually prefers to cross on a place where the ground is quite stable. Um, she doesn't want to walk in soft mud. So if she's crossing there habitually and you can build up even a firmer base for her, then she's more likely to go there. Why we even make a stream crossing or whatever is because we're improving the environment and keeping the cattle out of the stream. That as much as we possible. have to, they have to cross somewhere. But if we can, if we can pick and train them to cross in the best place with the least disturbance impact. impact. Yep. That's what we're trying to do. I think it speaks to though how much you care about the land, that you're thinking of those details, right? And people do know that um, stream crossing is important with all the recreation and headwaters and the work we've been doing, you know, mm -hmm. yep. steer clear of water, wheels out of water. Yeah. I think people are starting to realize that bridges and stream crossings do matter. Yeah. And so, I think there's a good opportunity there to And maybe we can connection. make a parallel too, right? If we're trying to direct cows to those designated trails yeah. and stream crossings, yeah. mm -hmm. it's the same thing with OHP users, exactly. right? We do less we do less damage to the stream bank itself than Yeah. Just the fact that you're thinking about that and, and doing that actively yeah. you know, speaks to 
the sustainability of agriculture. So what else are you doing here like that in terms of techniques or something that you might not even be aware of um, as uh, somebody who isn't involved in the community? What are those things? One of our most important um, lessons over the last 30 years has been to reduce the impact of the cattle around all of our water because water is our key resource. Our, we, don't, we can have all the grass we want, but if we don't have water, we can't produce beef. So keeping the cattle out of our catch basins and out of our developed springs is our number one priority. That number one priority requires then what we call off-site water systems. So we use lots of solar power and we also use electric electricity in the sense that it's solar powered as well to keep cattle out of those places where the water is abundant and pump into a trough where they then come to water. So we call that an off-site system. And even at our portable <coughs> off-site systems where we move the troughs, we uh, put mat down, matting down so they don't punch the ground out where the trough sits. The next year when we come, we'll, we'll situate the trough in, in, in a different spot. So it's not always the same same place in the, on the ground. Right. Yes. Well, you mentioned moving water around to move the cattle. Mm -hmm. How else do you move the cattle and what, why do you move the cattle? Yeah, we have an incredible asset here in the sense that we have free flowing thermal springs. Mm. Free flowing thermal springs mean they, the water comes out of the ground, it doesn't need pressure and it never need, it oh. never freezes. Hmm. It never, we, it always just runs. We design our grazing plan, so we have a managed grazing plan and we design our plan around where the water is. We graze in a low frequency, high intensity management form. We put lots of mouths and lots of feet on a piece of grass in a fairly small place and we never go back there in the same grow growing season. In fact, we don't even go there at the same time in the following grazing season, uh, the following year. So our fields always depend on where the water is. So we manage our cows and manage the grass based on where the water is, because the water is number one, the number one resource. That high intensity, low frequency is very much how these grasslands were actually developed by the buffalo herds that came through with lots of feet, lots of mouths for short periods of time, and then they wouldn't come back. So the grass had lots of rest in between, and that's what we're attempting to mimic here. So how has mimicking nature and natural cycles benefited the ranch or the land? Doing it, doing it that way, like the buffalo used to do, and when they were here, is um, they come for a short period of time, they graze it, and then they leave. So that uh, the grass has a, as a chance to, to reestablish, send roots deeper down so that it has way more uh, water retention in the soil. So then when we get into these, like the last four or five years that we've had, where we get kind of having long, hot, hot dry spells, our grass has, uh, has actually stayed very healthy because we have, we have a lot of uh, mass of, of, of grass that's, that's dormant on the ground. Mm and it creates a, a sunscreen, if you want to call it. So it's, the sun isn't baking the soil and the water will stay underneath it. It's like a, a shade. Cool, that's very neat. Yeah. Right now, we're kind of in the middle of a pretty, a pretty severe drought year. Um, have you had to make any changes to what you're doing to adapt to that or to adjust? We're actually monitoring the herd more, much more closely. Number one, we monitor the water constantly and we are monitoring the grass more than we normally do just because of the high temperatures we've had and the lack of pre precipitation. We're probably moving faster than we normally do. I think it's important to recognize that one of our aha moments was when we learned that when a cow bites grass, she rips it. And when she rips it, it triggers a DNA message that said, grow your roots deeper. Your roots. So, your roots deeper, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, that's what we're attempting to do here, is to grow the ro roots as deep as we can. We have a very diverse range of 
feed here in the sense that the cows don't just eat grass, they eat everything. When you eat like the buffalo, it's with lots of feet and lots of mouths, they eat a little bit of everything. They even take the tops off flowers and off thistles. So it's more like they mow everything. They're not so selective, which, which means that everything is getting that rip happening. It was a really important message for Glenn and I to learn. And so what happens with us is when we do that, do that initial graze and then we leave, the grass then has a chance to regenerate. And it has, in most cases, it has a whole year to do that, which means those roots are deep. A lot of our grasses actually stay in the vegetative form. They do not go to seed. Wow. And we actually prefer that because we have a modified grazing system here that is full of Timothy and Kentucky Blue that we, we would just assume it didn't go to seed. It eats but it isn't what this was designed to be up here. We have some beautiful, beautiful native species of grass here, and if we had more of them, we'd be happier. So keeping it in that vegetative stage is also really important to us, and that's part of the high intensity, low frequency. So what kind of wildlife do you get around here, and how are they part of the ranch? We have everything at the ranch. We have grizzly bears, black bears, moose, elk, Lots of whitetail and muleys, cougar. We've seen just about everything. Lynx. Lynx, yeah. Lots and lots of bird life, both little songbirds, but also big, because we have lots of grouse up here, a wide variety of grouse. Um, the, ranch is, um, the ranch is a pretty cool place, full of diversity. That's why we manage it the way that we do. First of all, to leave it for the next generation, better than we found it. Uh, for our grandchildren, but also for the next botanists and scientists and conservationists and next ranchers. It's a place where, where that we're willing to share with so many people and with all of the wildlife around us. I used to tell our grade four students that when our grass is healthy, then the moose are also happy and healthy, just like the cows are. And if our water is, is safe, it's good for the cows, but it's also good for all of the wildlife as well. Thank you so much, Glenn and Kelly, for sharing your story with us today, and we will see you next time.